This is going to go on all afternoon. <laughs> it's very difficult for an academic to speak in a very condensed way. This is the greatest challenge. What's the point of getting to the point? What was the question? How did we start? <laughs> we get started with this. One more time. My motivation to place empathy at the center of this conference is a really a political one. I'm really concerned about the multiple crises we witness now. Empathy plays a very important role. Empathy, or the lack thereof. Sometimes people talk about empathy as if it were only um, about affection. But on the other hand, there is cognitive empathy. So I can think about what others think, what others desire, what others want to do. Something even more terrible than you. No, my deformed friend. So it's not only about affection. Another thing is what is called contagion. Sometimes when a baby starts crying, another baby is just crying. Sometimes if males engage in aggressive interaction and a bypasser comes, he engages in aggression as well. And a fourth option would be morals. Sometimes people call empathy what we would call compassion or concern for others. And there are different pulls in different directions when you think about these four things. You'll be too busy to be lonely. So I've developed work that I call entangled empathy. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about the way in which we can empathize with other animals. So human animals and non-human animals. care of the dying needs compassion, not empathy. What I'm arguing for is a change in attitude amongst people who look after uh, the dying. I'm arguing for a change in attitude, particularly amongst doctors, because that's my own professional group, but also amongst nurses and other healthcare professionals. Everything except save my patient. Compassion is quite different and it consists of a number of different attributes. There's kindness, there's honesty, there's courage, there's competence, and there's this thing I call bottom. And it's a very old fashioned term, which means that the person in possession of bottom has substance and authenticity. Having emerged from the theatre, I use theatre processes to bridge divides as some of the, the process work that I do. And I'm really interested in the process of character development. Because with character development, you literally step into a different weight emphasis, a different breathing pattern, a different rhythm tempo. And this creates different thinking and feeling patterns distinct from the actors. Situation normal, taboo, the greatest mystery in history. So it, it gives you an embodied perspective that is different to your own, and it's a very difficult thing to sustain it. And I'm interested in can, what does this do to the neural maps inside us, and can we use these processes to cultivate empathy in others? My interest in those new forms of empathy comes from the interactions between humans and robots, which, although forthcoming, are actually happening now. I relate my research specifically to sex robots introduced to the market last year and those hugging robots used in hospitals. The interaction with whom um, engages people emotionally and physically and definitely generates new kinds of responses, which I find absolutely revolutionary. I'm looking at artist videos by different international video artists who make um, videos after their dog died and I consider those videos as uh, works of mourning which raise empathy for the dead dog as well as uh, for the surviving human, the, the artist in this case because I've done a project in the last couple of years on a social media technology which is essentially designed to facilitate empathy. So there's a large mental health charity in the UK called Mind. They, they, they designed a social media site called Ellie Friends that's designed to facilitate peer support for people with mental health problems. Your emotions can be your own greatest enemy. Or under control, 
Your emotions can make you healthier and happier. So I'm really interested in how this kind of technology maybe facilitates certain kinds of empathy or limits some and con constraints and limits some and what, what possibilities it, it arise. The abject, um, the monstrousness. When women get too powerful, they uh, destabilise society because they upset conventions and the same in healthcare if nurses get too powerful they might destabilise medicine. Showing the many departments that you will work with and the variety of facilities for patient care. And there are a lot of horror stories in nursing about nurses. Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a monstrous nurse and she uh, by examining her, we can understand somehow um, how the world of nursing is riven with anxieties and sometimes horrific conditions that make it hard for nurses to be empathic. So I'm a professional empathy skeptic. Most of my work is challenging empathy. So I feel a little bit like a factory farmer coming to a conference on animal rights. A guilt should not be bred until it is eight months of age. So I've become very interested in the idea that empathy has a history. It's a construct that was developed, it coined only just over 100 years ago, but even related concepts like sympathy are quite recent. So most of my current work is exploring the genealogy of empathy and sympathy and looking at the cultural conditions that have made these emotional constructs so attractive. One familiar concern about empathy is that it's very preferential. We're more empathetic to our near and dear. But the study of the genealogy of empathy reveals deeper problems. Empathy has been systematically yoked to capitalism. It's been uh, used as a defense for imperialism. The colonial expansion has involved a sense that we in white Western Europe are really in some way superior. We've developed economic systems and moral systems uh, that are in some way more civilized and more enlightened than people in other parts of the world. So empathy is directional. It's directed at people who we consider inferior and the superiors have this kind generosity that they offer to try and bring those downtrodden, oppressed people up to our level. And empathy works as a kind of equalizer that treats people who are struggling and suffering as if they need our help and the way they can be helped is by becoming more like us. I think that's problematic. From the earliest edges of recorded time, people have sought to make more of their lives than satisfying the everyday necessities of food and drink, clothing and shelter. One thing that's been quite interesting to me in thinking about the politics of empathy is how even though empathy is routinely positioned as universal, right, as something that everybody has or has the capacity to develop, it's so often socially privileged subjects who are called on to have more empathy for those who are less privileged in various ways. And I think what's significant about that is that empathy, in a sense, then becomes a privileged emotion. So what might happen, or how might we see things differently if we turn this relation around? If we think about how empathy might work differently when it's voiced or expressed from those on the margins, from those that are routinely posed as simply the objects or the recipients of empathy. There are impressive parallels everywhere in this truly wonderful world. first thing that everybody said was, what mother wouldn't know that her son was about to unleash a massacre on a population? How could she not know? And she didn't necessarily disagree with that. She wanted to figure out how, how can a loving, attentive, well-educated mother not know that she's raising a mass murder? And obviously this is the ultimate hard case. She inspired us to take on this project to think through what empathy means under these terrible conditions. People enjoy, to some degree, the suffering of other people. Why do they do that? Isn't that strange? And I think there's some part of that is what I call everyday empathic sadism. So for example, terrorists may not be acting out of pure callousness or hatred they may also act out of empathy. They have identified and em empathized so much with their side. It could be suffering people, it could be a religious group or 
with whomever they feel for, that they demonize the other side to that degree that they feel like they deserve death, that they deserve terrorist acts. So empathy, instead of bringing two sides that are in conflict, bring, bringing them together, often can also pull them further apart, lead to fuel tensions, and even lead to acts like terrorism. I define and I'm interested in how far empathy helps us while trying to approach colleagues from other disciplines to be empathetic towards their expectations and their uh, mental framework when we want to frame interdisciplinary relationships between the arts, technologies and the natural science. Fear is the response to loud noises or loss of support. And I'm very interested in also in how far entanglement is a form of empathy when it comes to entanglements between disciplines that normally don't talk to each other. One of my primary aims as a scholar and scientist is to investigate patterns that cross scales. Clearly, empathy as a human phenomenon is not in the scale of atoms and molecules or in the scale of the evolution of the early cells. But at some point, as animals form societies with bonding relationships and relationships of affinity and in-group, out-group, empathy came in as we go to culture with language and complex ways of describing emotion. Life as a whole forms a system in combination with the non-living part of the planetary surface. I put a panel together called Elemental Empathies, which became an opportunity to think about the, the, the resonance between matter and life and how this systematizes itself over evolutionary time. There's always the mathematical possibility of coincidence. So it really doesn't have to do with psychic responses per se, so much as the sense that, there is, that the, the planet has its own modes of sensorium. Rocket ships sped through star-studded space. What I will speak about is the idea that empathy is not necessarily something positive, but it has its dark side because it can be easily manipulated. The Nazis have shown how easily it is, uh, we can, can be brought to as empathize with the wrong people or to loathe the right people. On the one hand, many speakers are bad communicators in a sense that they don't listen carefully. Now I'd like you to guess what the speakers were feeling or thinking. Therefore, kind of lack in empathy in a sense. And on the other hand, we think we have a moral obligation to display empathy and that can lead to misunderstandings too. Well, I don't think Landis knew quite what to do with his hands. Is that right, Landis? Well, I didn't feel like I belonged up there. Miss Graham? I think Miss Wood had the best approach. She looked at us directly, and I felt she really wanted to tell us something. For the past 10 years, I've been painting uh, small portraits of women, and the main subject of those portraits is the um, the gap between the external presentation and manifestation of the emotions on the face and what's really behind it. And the empathy is very important for that reason in my work. Particularly around some of the neurophilosophies uh, and picking on people like uh, Thomas Metzinger. So I've come here today looking at Metzinger's work uh, around mirror neurons and playing with the concept of a tunnel and I'm kind of counterpoising that with uh, Deleuze's idea of the fold. It's a very whitehead influenced idea and seeing how they play those two concepts with, uh, with empathy. I think what's most interesting about the work that we're presenting here is the idea of the multiple layers of empathy. So you've got the mothers who struggle to appropriately empathize with their children. So it's hard to empathize with a child who is violent, but on the other hand, this is their mothers, and sometimes they over-empathize, 
and so they're, they're kind of uh, exhibiting hyper empathy towards these children and so there's this fine line between where do you care for your children versus where do you care for the community you know how do you keep the community safe I'm looking at Cicely Saunders, who was the founder of the Modern Hospice Movement, and looking at her kind of, I suppose, her philosophy, um, part of which is about total pain. Uh, and total pain is kind of where I come from in terms of empathy, because it's, it's almost a spatialised concept of, um, of personhood, in a way, and of the experience you have at the end of life as being a pain that emanates out. It's not just your physical pain, it's your mental, your social, your spiritual pain as well. Gemütlichkeit is the German word for the good life. I'm working on the question how we empathize with fictional characters, especially in films, movies, quality TV series, you might know. I'm also interested in how we overtake perspectives and what perspectives are at all and which role imagination plays here, for example. And this is where empathy comes into play because empathy means something like um, overtaking another perspective by using our imagination, but it also means to catch or to, to understand the expressions of the other. And I think film is a very good um, object or medium where all this comes together, namely facial expressions, for example, but also the expression of music and, and voice and so on. Watching all the girls, watching all the girls, watching all the girls go by. A text by Lucy Irek that's about empathy. And of course, she comes from a feminist philosophy. And to her, at least, there can be no uh, interrelation, no interconnectedness, no mutual understanding without the recognition of the sexual difference. And uh, we talk about what to do with the people drowning in the Mediterranean. Uh, all the time. We talk about how academia and the humanities can help uh, people getting a, a deeper understanding of what is actually happening there so it doesn't just become unreal. I'm especially interested now in what fiction writers know that might be of use to neuroscientists, um, especially say, with the binding problem which is about how do you combine qualities in different senses, like vision, hearing, smell, taste. Um, how do you put all those together to create one unified representation of a person, place, or thing? Um, a good writer can do that in just a few sentences. You know, can activate the reader's imagination and get those senses going. And scientists have something to learn there. It is part of my remit as uh, Vice President of the University with responsibility for research to ensure that uh, we have a, an environment in which disciplines can work together. Metal experts count and even measure the crystal structures which make up iron and steel. How do we achieve this? I always give an example that it would be nice to place a department of theology next door to a department of theoretical physicists so that they could actually learn what they do on a daily basis and the methods that they use and they may well find that they are not actually so different from one another as they might think. And I'm going to see this outtake all over the place on YouTube. Yeah. This, this complete idiot. <laughs> we're we're still we haven't gotten even maternal leave yet. No, so, but but Ivanka is going to make it happen. This is very acceptable. It's very interesting. I think it's so weird. So, let's go from the front. The more you do it, the more you get hurt. What about the first part? Can I cut off some of the first part and just get to... Same? I just did. Yeah. Start again. Yeah. 
colleague John Crane and I. I don't think we have space to explain <laughs> that. We got to it at the very end. I got to it. <laughs> You guys are cool. Yeah, you guys are very cool. <laughs>